Thank you, Tate, for the introduction. And thank you, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. In one of my hats, I am the local representative for an Australian government regional program, the Pacific Leadership Program. PLP's theory of change and its approach in the Pacific supports what we call developmental leaders, the movers and shakers, the change agents, perhaps the deviants, uh, to move forward a change that they are passionate about. Um, as well as that, the PLP approach has recently, through DLP, uh, based research and exploration, encourage partners on the national level to work in coalitions. In Samoa, six out of 14 government ministries are headed by women, including the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and the Ministry of Revenue. 10 out of 16 state-owned enterprises have women CEOs. Our Water Authority, uh, the Development Bank of Samoa, we had our first uh, woman Attorney General way back in 1997. The Governor of the Central Bank of Samoa is a woman. We have women judges in the Supreme Court and in the District Court. Female enrollment rates exceed male enrollment rates in secondary and tertiary education, and a high proportion of urban businesses in Samoa are owned or managed by women. So in these respects, Samoa's gender equality indicators are comparable to those of Australia and New Zealand. However, the but. Political participation of women in Samoa, and on this slide, you can do a little bit of a where's Wally. You can't, can you find me the woman? This is our, mem this is our members of parliament, this is parliament sitting. We are ranked amongst the lowest in the world. We sit at 131, near the bottom of the world scale of 139 countries for women in parliament. Samoa, since its independence in 1962, the first Pacific Island to gain independence, has never had more than five women in our 49-member parliament. In the last election, 2011, only two women got through to parliament. So, am I talking about the same place I just described earlier? Why? Today I share with you why there is a barrier to women's participation in Samoa and a strategic approach that we have been exploring, PLP has been supporting, uh, that hopes to change their mindsets and hopes to change this low level of political participation of women. Let me talk about our Fa'amatai system. Samoa has a unique legal and political system known as Fa'amatai. I was introduced as having two chiefly titles. Uh, Amatai, it, it's, a, it's a system that revolves around the governance of family leaders known as Matais. Matais are holders of chiefly titles who are selected quite democratically by the family members themselves to lead and look after their extended families. They're expected to be well versed in family history. They're expected to know the uh, hereditary rights of the family within the village. And they're expected to know what the privileges of chiefly title are when sitting in a village council meeting. They must know the traditional protocol and they must have the gift, but not of Samoan oratory. The Matai then represents his or her family into a village council, the village Fono, we call it, which is formally recognized in Samoa as a system of local government. The village Fono is, is responsible for community order. It organizes all aspects of social and economic development in the village. And 240 such villages make up Samoa. They control and preserve uh, village lands and resources. And Samoa included special measures in its constitution when it fought for independence to preserve this traditional structure. It has, it has governed Samoa for centuries. You must also, and this is one of the things they did at Constitution at Independence, you must hold a Matai title to be eligible to run for Parliament. And this was something that was unique when Samoa was applying for independence. The UN had to give special permission for that, because in some ways it was bordering on human rights. But you must hold the Matai title to be eligible to run for Samoa Parliament even today. Samoans all over the world and in Samoa, well, they stand by this Fa'amatai system. We practice it even here in Melbourne. Yesterday at a church 
that I attended, they were practicing the village funo, the, the church organization, just like it was a village funo, acknowledging their matais, putting everyone in the right hierarchy of space, uh, knowing the relational space between each other. So we practice it, we believe in it. It's at the core of the country's social stability. It's a great system, but for one perhaps minor and crucial imperfection, it is not gender inclusive. Women are not equally represented. A research by the National University of Samoa highlights emerging faults in this traditional system of ours. The realities that the research confirmed is one, the village council, the century-old system of governance is deteriorating in terms of good governance. They're just making bad decisions. Bad decisions impacting on women's rights, impacting on youth development, on land usage, and in some cases, even the education of children because they run the village primary schools. The research showed only 10% of Samoan Matai are women. So put that together with that. Only 5% of the village-based Matais are women. So in a local village council or a local government in Samoa, where there'd be 50 such Matais sitting around, there would be only two or three women, if you're lucky. But this was the most damning. In 34 of our villages, there were rules that had been developed that simply said, well, we don't allow women to sit in this circle. We don't allow women to sit, whether you have a title, so remember, I'm talking about women Matai titles holders. So you hold, you hold Matai title, your family has had this discussion, they've bestowed the leadership on you, and in the village say, no, you can't attend the meeting. 75%, 79%, almost 80% of the women that were surveyed, the Matais that were surveyed, people like myself, who are women, the 10% of us who hold the titles, chose not to participate in village council meetings because they were made to feel unwelcome by sitting council members. Just at this point, I'd like to show a photograph there. That is my niece. She's educated at Auckland University through the scholarship program. She's an engineer, graduated with honors, works for Baker, builds airports. She came home for Christmas, and I took her along to a village council meeting. This is her sitting across from me. I'm sitting on the other side, the only two women sitting around this meeting on this day. Women in young Matai, or urban Matai, uh, they live in, a, in urban Apia. They don't attend out of fear. They fear they don't have their lack of knowledge and they don't know enough about the village protocols. Natalia is sitting there, more frightened than she's ever been in probably most things in her life, just by sitting there amongst this. They don't make it very welcoming when they, don't, when they know that you're not well versed in the language and in the protocols. So basically, the research affirmed that the male dominant village councils, well, they didn't want women there or urban matives. So, what do we do? Why is it scary to be there? Just a little bit of context. Because they laugh, snigger, and joke about urban Matai, much like bullies do. They see a lack of knowledge as disgraceful shame. The village Matai has little or no regard for your level of education, for your professional position, um, or your wealth. Wealth to them is how much you know what to do when you're there, how much you know about traditional culture and space. So our vision was to change these existing mindsets. How are we going to do that? Well, we thought that we would send urban-based Matais back into this system. We will take more Natalias here and make them attend the village council meetings. Right, let's send them out there. Now, don't forget, when I, went, when I went, went, went through all of the women that were leading all these organizations in Samoa, ministries and SOEs, every one of them holds a Matai title. In fact, if you become a CEO of something and the village that your parents are from realize that you don't have a title, they'll track you down. And they'll say, put a title in front of that girl's name. And she goes to that conference called Sina Rexla. Who is Sina Rexla? You need to be a Limalu to be anybody. Right, so they whack these titles in front of our names. But I don't think that they are, they're thinking that we'll be ever turning up to any of the village council meetings. So our intervention is, let's get a group of urban Matai. Let's get a group of those influential, we call us, they call us the doves that they let off to fly in Samoa. Lupe Fa'alele is the word, right? You come from this village because your great-grandmother's from here, and we've let you fly off and look where you are. So they're very proud of us. 
So there is a level of influence that you have there when you come back into the village. When you drive to the village and you park up and you go into this village council meeting, they don't see you as the women that are in the other family preparing the food, right? Because you, you were able to drive yourself here. Right? So you walk into here and, well, actually, you're quite welcome to sit there. But lo and behold, if one of the other poor women that were making the food get a title and come and sit here, I think that that wouldn't work too much for the boys over there. So we trained up, we took 20 people that were emerging leaders. We, we can't say, we didn't facilitate their emergence as leaders. They were already leaders in their own right. But we're facilitating their confidence and their, and their participation and their engagement into their village councils. We're actually training them. There's a wonderful man who has a Samo culture center. He has set up his backyard like a village. And he's put together a Samo family that's a round structure. one so I'm going, going like this. And he allows us to come in and practice with our 20 elite urban matais that we've selected. And we practice being out there. We practice feeling uncomfortable. He teaches us what the protocols are. He teaches us what to say, where to sit, where your chief title sits within the structure of everything. And that is our intervention. It doesn't end there. When they come back from their village council meeting where they've gone and they come back to us, we then create another space for them. It's the mentoring process. It's encouraging them to please go back to the next month village meeting. So one of my friends came back after the first one and she said, when the karma came to me, and I was, and I had been running through, and this, this is the Samoa Law Reform Commissioner, by the way, a lawyer trained at Waikato University, and I've been trying to get, I, I was set, I was driving all the way out there with what I was going to say at the karma ceremony. It's like three words. And when it came to me, but it has to be deep and meaningful to these guys, I said, when it came to me, the guy next to me goes, huh, in Samoa, huh, you can speak in English if you want. And it just threw her. You know, she said, I got nervous, I'm never going back there again. But we create a safe space, so and they are mentored by elderly, forward-thinking Matais at the university, at the National University of Samoa. And then we have these great conversations where we encourage them not to be scared and to go back again. But they share the experience of when, how they were sniggered upon. We also share positive experiences, like mine. When I get there, I go and I have breakfast with the women. And this is the, what was it, silent power? Uh, I have breakfast with the women. I, I always do because I'm driving in and I already feel like I'm not one of the women in the village. And so I always make sure I sit there for breakfast. I only walk across to be the only woman sitting at this meeting when I see that uh, they're ready for me. The women then tell me, for our meeting, you've got to have your legs crossed. And that's the other thing that they joke about with us. They laugh at us, the fact that we're moving every 10 minutes because we're so uncomfortable with our legs crossed in front of us. Right? And they're sitting there with their legs crossed quite comfortably. At the village, at breakfast with the women, they will tell me absolutely everything that's going to happen. Tell me the agenda, and often they never get it wrong, they tell me what the decisions are going to be. <laughs> Four hours later, uncomfortable sore knees, and all those decisions are exactly like what they told me what they were going to be. Right, so we, when we come in to do this intervention, we need to be careful that we're not you know, overstepping those other power dynamics. Those women are empowered, you know. They love it that I'm there and they encourage me, but they don't want to be there. They don't want to be there at all. So these are the kinds of things that we're navigating through. How can development partners help this kind of intervention? Well, PLP, and it's a DFAT program, it's an Australian government program, it helps us to explore these things. It helps us to fund simple little interventions. But we also acknowledge and that's why it's great to be at a conference like this, that we are going to need some research along this intervention. We're going to need to, to act, to, you know, have, to have some engagement of research as to how we're going to be doing, how many of these urban elites are going to continue to engage in this way. Why are we doing this? Because we need that governance structure to change. So how are we doing it? Here is a man, sorry, here's a young man, he's getting a Matai title. And he got stuck. So you see Natalia sitting, sitting at the back there. He got absolutely stuck and it was horrible. He learned something off by heart. Right? So he, he, I got him onto our program straight away after this day. And he went up like this with the car, and he's looking down because he's completely forgotten what he learned off by heart. And the whole place just roared with laughter. Right? So that young man, if he's not intervened, if he's not mentored, he'll never go back to the village. All right. So. I conclude by saying, what are we doing? We're taking champions, 
champions from within. We want them to immerse themselves into the issue. We want them to be actively participating and we want them to be part of the solution. How does DFAT, how does development partners help us do it? By being flexible, by doing fit for purpose programs and by supporting local development leaders, local change agents, local slightly deviant approaches to be able to do this. I hope to be here in 10 years, not, we're having an election this year, we have them every five years. I hope to be here in 2021 to tell you that more of these village councils are accepting women and that therefore women can get into parliament through that system. And in 10 years time, I hope to be here saying that we've broken that 10% that we've never had and that more women are participating in politics. Thank you.